Buenos días. Bienvenidos y muchas gracias por acompañarnos en el Foro de las Américas de la Semana Mundial del Agua. Antes de iniciar, les recordamos que hay interpretación simultánea en español, inglés, francés y portugués. Pueden hacer la selección del idioma de su preferencia en el icono del mundo en la parte baja de su pantalla. Gracias. Good morning. Welcome and thank you for joining us in this session of the Focus on the Americas at World Water Week. Before starting, we remind you that we have interpretation in Spanish, English, French, and Portuguese. Please make your language selection in the world icon at the bottom of your screen. Thank you. Bom dia. Bem-vindos e muito obrigada por participar nessa sessão do Foco nas Américas para a Semana Mundial da Água. Antes de começar, lembramos que que há interpretação para espanhol, inglês, francês e português. Faça a seleção do idioma de sua preferência clicando no ícone do mundo na parte inferior da tela. Obrigada. Bonjour. Bienvenue et merci de vous joindre à nous dans cette session de la Semaine mondiale de l'eau qui se focalise sur les Amériques. Avant de commencer, nous vous rappelons qu'il y a interprétation en espagnol, anglais, français et portugais. Veuillez faire la sélection de la langue de votre choix dans l'icône du monde en bas de votre écran. Merci. Bienvenidos a todos desde cualquier lugar del mundo donde nos sigan. Mi nombre es Hugo Contreras, del equipo de The Nature Conservancy, y hoy tendré el gusto de acompañarlos durante toda esta sesión. Y para comenzar, demos la bienvenida a Todd Garner. Todd es un experto en temas de infraestructura natural. Dirige la iniciativa de infraestructura natural y de Cities for, uh, Forest for Climate, um, Cities for Forest, en WRI. Así es que, Todd, el piso es tuyo. Bienvenidos y espero que disfruten la sesión. Gracias. Thank you, Hugo, and welcome, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Todd Gartner with the World Resources Institute, and I'm dialing in today from Portland, Oregon. Uh, it's exciting to see over 270 folks on the line joining in for this World Water Week session. Having a quick scan at the registrants, uh, I'm inspired to see attendees from across Latin America and the Caribbean and beyond. Um, I only hope that next year we can all be together in Stockholm. On behalf of the co-conveners at the World Resources Institute, IDB, the CAF, the Nature Conservancy, and the FEMSA Foundation, we greatly appreciate your interest and engagement. The main objective of this session is to inspire dialogue and understand how blended and climate finance can enhance water security and how we can apply these new sources of finance to advance and scale nature-based solutions on the ground throughout the LAC region. We will first hear about the state of climate finance for natural infrastructure from Graham Watkins at the Inter-American Development Bank. We will then further dive into how climate and blended finance can be utilized by Chibesa Pensulo, a water specialist at the Green Climate Fund. We're also fortunate to learn how nature-based solutions are being implemented and financed in Brazil from Mara Ramos from Sao Paulo's largest water management company, Sebespi. Mara will speak to how climate and blended finance can accelerate NBS and be applicable for others. We will then lead into an opportunity to hear and address questions from those attending this session. With that, it is an honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Graham Watkins, uh, the Chief of the Climate Change and Sustainability Division at the Inter-American Development Bank. Graham has over 30 years of experience and leads the bank's efforts to support government climate policy and planning in Latin America and the Caribbean increase the availability of finance to drive climate transformation, mainstream climate and bank operations, and build understanding around sustainable infrastructure, climate risk, and decarbonization. Uh, Graham, it is an honor to have you here today. Please take it away. Thank you, Todd. Uh, thank you, Hugo, and thanks for this opportunity, and thanks to everyone who's listening. Um, thanks also to CAF, TNC, and FEMSA, and particularly to WRI, um, simply because we're actually doing a program right now, a project right now with WRI to look at pipelines for nature-based solutions and financing for nature-based solutions, hoping to unlock new investments in the future. What I'm going to do is, is try and give an overview of why and how to unlock climate finance for water solutions, uh, including a focus on nature-based solutions. Uh, 
at the outset, I want to admit that look, the climate finance world is complex and confusing. I've heard of it called a, a mix of alphabet soups, different alphabet soups. There are many sources of financing, so it can be complex. So in the link, after I finish talking, I'm going to put in a, a, a connection to a th program we've got called NDC Invest, which tries to simplify the complex climate finance world for clients um, and s sort of separates it into programming and planning support, accelerating pipeline support, uh, mobilizing concessional finance support, and also for driving business and market uh, innovations. What I specifically want to do today, though, is I want to talk about water, climate, and biodiversity. Uh, obviously, they're connected. Uh, I then want to talk about more specifically how climate finance can be tied to water and biodiversity in theoretical terms. And then I'm going to give some examples of how climate finance is actually connected to water operations. Admittedly, this is more from a public sector side. So I want to say that at the outside. Um, First, we all know that water is critical. There's no discussion about that. It's critical for people. It's critical for sectors, energy sector, agriculture sector, and transport sectors, amongst others. And it's also crucial to delivering the SDGs at the end of the day. Um, we also know that delivering water and sanitation services is becoming increasingly complex, in part because of urbanization and because of climate change. Uh, there are growths and shifts in demand that are affecting where we need to be delivering the services. Uh, issues about weak sanitation programs or support and industrial pollution are going to affect water quality uh, and water security ultimately is going to depend on good governance, good policy, access to finance, uh, the need to address climate change and the effective management of biodiversity. And just going in a little bit more detail into that, those links between water, biodiversity and climate, um, clearly the loss of biodiversity or the, cri the biodiversity crisis that we're facing the deforestation is going to affect watersheds. It's going to affect and have direct implications for hydrology and water flows. And as we know in, the, in a place like the Amazon, it's, land use change can actually affect substantive water cycles and precipitation in very distant agricultural areas. Changes in biodiversity therefore are ultimately going to affect water security. Climate change also is gonna drive variability in water balances. There's gonna be temporal and spatial shifts in precipitation affecting hydrology and water availability. Precipitation is also going to change in the high and mid latitudes and equatorial regions. We know that already. And shifts are going to occur in different cycles. It's highly complex. They're going to occur at a daily level, seasonal, annual, and in decadal time series. Um, the climate models actually show that changes are going to happen. There's going to be more droughts and floods. I mean, I think we just need to think about California today and what's going on there today. Uh, there's gonna be increasing frequency and intensity of storms uh, that are gonna affect water and sanitation systems. I think we, there we just need to think about what's happening to, with Laura also today. Uh, water scarcity is gonna remain a challenge in lack, and that actually has direct consequences for health issues as well, which I'll come back to later on. So all of these interactions are actually opportunities for climate finance to have climate finance help drive transformation to achieve long-term resilience and ensure water security. The first point I want to make there is that water projects really need to take into account disaster and climate risks. And in that sense, we actually have developed a methodology actually with about, I would say, five to 10 years of work that uh, addresses disasters and climate-related disasters in the context of operations. Uh, we know operations in Latin America and the Caribbean are affected and exposed to hazards. Uh, so the methodology we have is actually stepwise and incremental because you don't want to massively invest in an operation that really doesn't need much, much risk management. The stages are basically you evaluate the hazards, you evaluate sector criticality, the, the criticality and vulnerability of that sector. You undertake a qualitative or quantitative analysis. And lastly, and probably most importantly, you involve all the stakeholders in that process. All of that work was actually supported by climate finance. Um, secondary, water projects are also big opportunities for enhancing resilience or uh, contributing to adaptation. In most situations, you can do, do this kind of work by using gray infrastructure. But one of the areas that we really want to push in the future is to use nature-based solutions to actually solve these issues. So you're addressing both the biodiversity and the climate issues and the water issues at the same time. Uh, and we are also finding that nature-based solutions may be cheaper, they can serve the same purpose, and they also bring these other co-benefits. 
And examples of that include watershed conservation to improve water quality of flows for dams or forest management systems for watersheds and water for cities, for example. Um, all this sounds great, uh, but it's also very challenging to incorporate these solutions into projects. Uh, in LAC, these challenges include the fact that uh, institutional policy contexts are not there yet, uh, practical guidance on the ground is weak, and we really need proof of concept and pilots to bring them to scale. So I really want to jump into what are the kinds of examples that we already have on the ground. The first one is in Honduras, which we have green climate fund funds plus an IDB public sector loan, which is basically enhancing resilience in coniferous forests that are crucial for the delivery of water services. This, the, the total amount of this is uh, $60 million with 35 million from GCF and 25 million of our own ordinary capital. And it's really to set up the systems and to better manage the forest to be able to deliver water services. A second example is in Bolivia where we have a PPCR grant uh, with IDB public sector loan, with local counterpart funds and with NDF grants, uh, with an NDF grant, which is being used to strengthen drinking water solutions, taking into account climate variability, but also dealing with internal conflicts and, and difficulties and competitions between the different uses of water in the area, but probably more fundamentally dealing with the retreating glaciers and the effects of climate change on buffer dollars. A third example comes from Panama, where we've got funds from an internal trust fund that's helping to support assessments that can lead to nature-based solutions investments. Uh, this trust fund is contributing a relatively small amount of money, but then it is tied back into a, that's 500,000, but tied back into a $100 million ordinary capital loan that is about improving urban habitats in Panama City uh, and including reducing flood risks. So in summary, there's clear links between water, climate and biodiversity. Clearly climate finance can be used to support water projects and, and it's already being used to support water projects uh, in, a, in a, a substantive way. I want to make two final groups of points. The first point is this, that this also needs to be tied to the COVID issue, the pandemic and recovery from the pandemic. Water and sanitation investments are crucial to the recovery process, crucial to health services. Nature-based solutions can be financed by climate funds and also actually are one of the best ways to get people back to work. Uh, there's a lot of analysis of this. We're about, we just produced, for example, an analysis of ILO on the kinds of jobs that this can produce. Uh, donors are also looking for ways to use the climate funds to contribute to sustainable recovery and going through the water angle is critical to that. The second point that I really want to talk about is that there are a lot of lessons learned about using climate finance. One is that leveraging is key. It really is key to be able to not just put in the climate finance but actually connect it to other sources of finance. There needs to be a focus on innovation, pilots, mobilization, transformational change, value chains, changing governance and regulatory systems, and creating incentives for people to move forward. Um, at the same time, we really need to think about cost effectiveness, the incremental effect of climate actions. Um, and finally, we need to look also at other innovative ways of generating finance, which can include thematic bonds, regional facilities, and insurances. And it, it would be remiss of me not to finish this by pointing out, yes, we also need to recognize the challenge of efficiencies and timeliness of accessing funds uh, and basically align the, the project cycles for both, for all sources of capital that are going into operations. And I'll stop there to try and keep on time. Thank you very much. Graham, muchísimas gracias. Um, Una liga perfecta o eh, agua, clima y eh, biodiversidad. Seguro a ustedes les está generando muchas preguntas. Por favor, usen la aplicación de Q&A. Y continuamos con Susana Osmet. Susana Osmet eh, es una experta, eh, consultora asociada de World Resources Institute y sabe mucho de infraestructura natural. Susan, por favor, la sesión es tuya. Thank you, Hugo. Hello, everyone. Uh, through these next two interviews, we're going to explore the linkages a little more uh, between nature-based solutions and water resilience and finance. And we're really here to discuss how we can increase investment in order to scale up water resilience in the Latin America and Caribbean region. So we will hear perspectives both from the finance side as well as the water utility side. 
Uh, first, I am pleased to introduce Chip Essa Pinsulo, who is a water specialist with the Green Climate Fund, which is a pr premier global climate finance institution. Chibesa is based in Korea, and she works on the appraisal of funding proposals for water projects. Welcome, Chibesa. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Great, let's begin. Chibesa, please tell us a little bit about GCF and especially what the Green Climate Fund is doing to advance water resilience in Latin America. Um, well, good morning, uh, dear audience, and uh, it's a great privilege for me to speak with you today. Uh, please allow me to start generally talking about um, what GCF is doing to advance resilience in general, and then I'll narrow down to, to the water sector. So there are four ways uh, through which uh, GCF is striving to uh, enhance climate resilience. The first is through accreditation of uh, national and regional direct access entities. Now, um, entities are the, the organizations that have gone through an accreditation process with the GCF, and there's a strong drive for us to make funds directly accessible to countries by accrediting local institutions uh, from those countries. And so in Latin America and the Caribbean, we have uh, 12, according to my count, uh, national entities, for example, Caixa in Brazil, Profonante in Peru, uh, Pact in Belize, and we also have six uh, regional um, direct access entities such as uh, CDB, CABE, and CAF. So that's a key way uh, through which we're trying to make funds um, available um, in a more direct manner than going through the larger uh, international entities. Uh, the second way is through uh, readiness funds. Now, most developing countries have uh, nominated to the GCF a national uh, designated authority. So that's a government ministry or government agency that acts as the focal point uh, between the GCF and, and, and the rest of the government. And um, these NDAs are able to access up to $1 million per year per country. Um, to build their own capacity and the capacity of direct access entities to design and implement um, climate projects. So readiness is the second way through which we are uh, striving to enhance resilience. The third way is national adaptation planning, and this is absolutely essential for resilience building. Uh, GCF makes uh, up to $3 million per country available for this. And so far, nine countries in Latin America and four countries in the Caribbean have um, national adaptation planning proposals that have been approved by the GCF and some have already started to access and use these funds. Now, the largest way in which uh, we support resilience um, is through projects, of course. That's where the largest share of GCF funds go. Um, to my count, there are six uh, water projects um, in the Latin American and Caribbean uh, region um, with about $225 million of GCF funding um, um, allocated to these six projects. Now, of course, we would like to go beyond that. <laughs> and uh, there are several entities working with us to develop more projects. So we have several more in the pipeline. But I'll just highlight um, a few of those that are already approved. So there is one project in uh, Guatemala, which is uh, building livelihood resilience to climate change in the upper basins in, in the country's highlands. And uh, this is through improving rainwater harvesting and irrigation. Um, there's also a GCF funded project in Grenada, which is focusing on building resilience in the water sector through revising water tariffs to make sure that funds are available for operation and maintenance of water infrastructure. Um, and also they are setting up a challenge fund for water use efficiency in the agricultural and tourism sectors. Uh, the third project I'd like to highlight is in Barbados. This is also a water sector resilience project. And this one is focusing on developing a national water sector master plan and uh, implementing water demand management measures. So we have these four means of, of building uh, resilience. It's accreditation, readiness, national adaptation planning, and of course, uh, project finance. 
Thanks, Chibesa. That's actually a very helpful orientation about how GCF works and also very good examples. Um, of course, I think we're all well aware that um, despite a significant presence in Latin America, especially on water issues, uh, GCF's work alone, you know, is, is not always enough to scale up truly uh, impactful efforts throughout the entire region. So I'm curious to know what are what is GCF doing to uh, direct more support to water uh, to the water sector and water resilience in Latin America. Okay, so again, I, I need to start generally and then zoom into the water sector um, at the end. So for all of the sectors in which uh, GCF is currently active, and uh, there are 11 of them, um, we are currently in the process of developing sector guides. And what we're trying to do um, through these sector guide uh, documents is to set out uh, from our own research, our own evidence-based kind of process, um, what we should be investing in and where to make the greatest amount of difference. And this is based upon the needs that countries have expressed in their nationally determined contributions. Um, and it's also based upon an analysis of the impacts of, of climate change across the world. So we want to be able to you know, look at that analysis, look at the needs expressed and figure out where do we put our limited resources because the resources we have available are limited. They're nowhere near what is needed to, to solve, uh, you know, all of the climate induced uh, problems of the world. So that's the first thing that we're doing. Um, and then secondly, we have um, a simplified approval process um, for projects that are requesting up to $10 million in GCF funding. And um, these projects must also have limited to zero um, environmental and social negative impacts. Uh, so for such uh, projects, we have the simplified approval process and we're currently developing technical guidelines um, to make it clearer what sort of activities are eligible for this simplified approval process and which ones are not, so that project developers know this from the outset. Uh, and most of these technical guides are already available. They're on our website. The water one will be published um, in the next month or so, so that will be available soon. Now, specifically for the water sector, we're going a step further and developing um, water sector specific project development guidance. And the reason for this is that we, we find ourselves over and over uh, giving similar comments on different funding proposals. So for instance, um, it, it might sound a bit surprising, but we still receive a lot of water supply projects that have no sanitation or wastewater component. And so we have to keep asking, um, you know, where is the, the, the additional wastewater that this project is going to generate uh, where's it going to go? How's it going to be managed? So we felt that instead of asking the same questions over and over again to different project proponents, we should put this into guidance so that anyone developing a water supply project knows that it should come with a wastewater component and so on. So we're doing this uh, subsector uh, specific guidance for four subsectors, namely IWRM, WASH, uh, flood control, and drought management. So we hope that through all of this um, guidance that we'd be putting out, we will get better quality of projects at entry and those projects will be able to move faster through the review process and uh, result in you know, faster transfer of funds uh, to, to the places where they're needed. Great, thanks. Uh, I'm certainly looking forward to seeing these guides. I imagine their relevance to project design may even extend beyond direct applicants to GCF. So mm -hmm. that's a wonderful contribution. Uh, these guides also sound like they send a very important signal to your applicants about what types of projects and project characteristics that GCF is looking for in this field. Mm -hmm. How about nature-based solutions? I'm curious to know, how is that part of Green Climate Fund's work? And maybe you could sh share an example. Okay, sure. And for sure, um, nature-based solutions are extremely important to the GCF. Um, in fact, um, you know, projects that come to us with gray infrastructure only these days are they have a hard time getting through the review process. Um, Nature-based solutions are essential both for, for flood control and for drought management. So we know that 
you know, restoring wetlands and reforesting uh, river banks and river headwaters restore natural flows. And, and these have, you know, benefits, whether you're trying to deal with, with floods or, or to deal with drought. Um, so we do have a couple of examples of where NBS uh, is being applied in water projects in the LAC region. Um, there is a project um, being implemented in Colombia, and this is about scaling up climate resilient uh, water management for vulnerable communities in, an, in a region called La Mojana, uh, which is very uh, flood prone. And the idea there is to restore wetlands so that uh, these wetlands are able to absorb the excess water and reduce the flood hazards to the local communities. Another example is a project in El Salvador, and this one is the opposite, it's dealing with drought, but the idea is to scale up climate resilient measures in the dry corridor of El Salvador by a reforestation that promotes aquifer recharge. So that makes more groundwater available for, for the vulnerable communities there. Great. So those are just two examples of uh, NBS application in, in GCF projects. Uh, that's wonderful. It's incredible how time flies. Uh, I'm afraid we need to move on, although I, I had more questions for you. Um, maybe we can return to them during the Q&A. Uh, thank you so much, Chibesa, for sharing what the GCF is doing and where you see opportunities for further support in Latin America. Um, looking forward to continuing the conversation in the Q&A. All right. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, next, I'll introduce Mara Ramos. Uh, she's the water resource manager for the Sao Paulo State Water and Sanitation Company, that is Sabespi. Uh, she's responsible for operations and monitoring of water supply to ensure production and treatment of supply to Sao Paulo. Um, and interestingly, as a side note, our organizations have joined forces with the Nature Conservancy to work on financing nature-based solutions in Sao Paulo. So Mara is the right person uh, for the job for this interview today. It's a pleasure to welcome you, Mara. Thank you, Suzanne. Good morning. It's a pleasure and honor to be here and exchange experience about such an important topic in this Water Week at Home with you all. Great. Yeah, thanks, Mara. Uh, first, Mara, um, since you're representing the water utility perspective today, we'd like to hear why, why a water utility would be interested in nature-based solutions. Could you tell us what is driving SubSB to adopt nature-based solutions? Sure. Uh, for providing water and sanitation services for the population dense and water care area of Sao Paulo State, SABESP faces increasing pressure to supply sufficient and good quality water to its 28 million customers, or 66% of the most populous state in Brazil. Uh, in 2015, Southeast Brazil grappled with its worst drought in nearly a century. Contingential and structured interventions and increased rainfall in the following years provided some relief, but treats to long-term water supplies will likely continue. The water availability per person is very poor, less than 200 cubic meters per inhabitant per year. So we cannot lose or waste any water. At Sabesp, we work with several different water sources. The metropolitan region of Sao Paulo, a megalopoly with almost 22 million people, is supplied almost integrally by superficial reservoirs. We can consider 6% of them protected, while the remaining resources are considered vulnerable in terms of its quality and land use occupation. The operational costs and technology required to treat properly the water is very different in those scenarios. We need to keep in mind uh, we provide a high quality water to the population. That's why we have the clarity that protecting the water sources is fundamental to keep our business in a sustainable path in a long term. Sabesp's catchment protection efforts stem back to the 80s, focus on conservation and restoration of its own property areas. In 2017, we launched a new program called Cinturão Verde, or Green Belt of Metropolitan Watersheds, and a digital publication called Beyond the Water that presents all the efforts in water protection and conservation. This report can be consulted in our website for those that want to know more about this program, okay? 
Thank you, Mara. That's that's really interesting. Uh, it, I think you really encapsulated the point that the landscape and watershed can have a tremendous impact on water supply and ultimately for the water that reaches our drinking water system. Um, and you also mentioned some initiatives already, but I'd like to know, are there any strategies that you're pursuing to finance nature-based solutions for Sebesby that you'd like to elaborate on? Yes. Uh Nowadays, uh, the protected areas surrounding the water reservoirs are part of the assets of Sabespi, and the maintenance is part of the operational cost of the company. Therefore, all the costs are covered by the water and sewage tariff. Sabespi's catchment protection program utilizes nature-based solutions like reforestation and revegetation to protect surrounding watersheds principally those of Cantareira system, the main water system responsible for supplying 30% of the actual demand and 50% of the reservation. The first component of the program requires the preservation of 33,000 hectares of land around watersheds, as you can see in this video now that represents 1.4% of all the remaining Atlantic forest in Sao Paulo state. It's not usual the water operator keep and maintain an asset like that. The second address the threat of encroaching urbanization on water sedge lands by promoting increased vegetation restoration. In 40 years, this vegetation cover increased from 61 to 79% in Cantareira reservoirs. This program was recognized by Inter-American Developing Bank as a best practice winner in the World Water Forum in 2018. Sabesp is also developing an adaptive plan for climate change to be launched next October and a nature-based solution will figure as part of its strategy and it's already presented in its water uh, master plan. Incredible. That's some very impressive achievements. Of course, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it right. So since you have some uh, quite a bit of experience on the topic, I'd like to know what are some of the challenges that you faced in adopting nature-based solutions? And how do you see the coordination among actors understanding that this must be a, a partnership type experience? Yes, it's not easy. There are many challenges we can quote to adopt these uh, nature-based solutions. First of all, the difficult to measure tangible benefits and results with catchment protection. Usually those benefits are long-term perceived and not directly related to a unique action. The other challenge is regarding to the misunderstanding about the roles and responsibilities. For example, the question about the payment by the water abstraction by operators already includes conservation practices financing. That's a question we are looking for the answer with responsible institutions in Sao Paulo. Then we can point to the understanding and recognition of watershed protection as a current cost in the tariff system. This leads to other issues like comparison, competition, regulation and efficiency consider other water operators. As we work now in uh, open market, those issues are relevant to keep isonomy, accountability, and to compare performance between the water operators. The last challenge I can point here is the maintenance of conserved and restored areas that have proven being very difficult due to burns and other losses considering those activities are not the primary attribution or part of our core business. As a result, we, we believe there is a need for cooperative and integrated efforts that join forces from diverse water demanding activities to overcome those challenges with a strong leadership and governance. Fantastic. Uh, by engaging multiple partners, there's perhaps also an opportunity to leverage multiple financing streams and funding streams towards uh, achieving nature-based solutions. And as Graham mentioned in his keynote, uh, you know, blended finance is the strategic use of different forms of finance to, to mobilize additional uh, sources of financing. So what role could blended finance play or, and partnerships play in accelerating the adoption of nature-based solutions in Sao Paulo? Yes, uh, we also believe that uh, blended finance or water funds joined by strong leadership and governance 
allied to clarification of roles and responsibilities could catalyze additional interaction between the utility and the other actors like regulator, the government and other water users in the direction to solve their water resources challenges. The integration between sectors, multiple users of water, the use of existing funds, blended finance, and existing governance arrangements among to institutional and regulatory incentives and mechanisms for all users that share, in the end, the same resources. Those are the key success factors to maximize the benefits of nature-based solutions. We can notice uh, initiatives that can help utilities like SABESP to be partner in local efforts alongside regulatory actors. Sao Paulo regulatory agency, ARCESP, has included the topic of nature-based solution in their regulatory agenda and is working with uh, the Nature Conservancy and World Resources Institute to keep, to develop a watershed conservation work plan. SABESP, is therefore part of this corporation studying a methodology to quantify the benefits of its initiatives and the best approach for developing an economic evaluation of that. And we truly hope that these partnerships be successful. Excellent, thanks Mara. Okay, there we have it. Thanks uh, to Mara and Chibesa, both of our speakers. And with that, I'll turn it back to Hugo. Thank you very much. Gracias, Susan. Eh, muy interesantes las conversaciones. Y ahora algunas de las preguntas que hemos recibido de los panelistas. La verdad es que hay mucho interés y eh, las voy a hacer todas de un jalón, como decimos acá en México, para maximizar el tiempo. La primera es para Graham. Y Graham, ¿cuáles son algunos de los retos que ustedes enfrentan para estructurar Blended finance, eh, particularmente relacionado eh, en la estimación de costos y beneficios. Para Chivesa, por favor, ¿cuáles son los cuellos de botella a los que se enfrentan los países de América Latina cuando tratan de desarrollar propuestas sólidas, bancables eh, para el GCF en las áreas de agua y biodiversidad? ¿Y cómo el GCF planea utilizar su propia experiencia para eh, leverage non-concessional loans, para ampliar el financiamiento de eh, agua y resiliencia. Y la última, para Mara, ¿cómo estiman, desde el punto de vista de esa vez, los beneficios económicos y financieros de las soluciones basadas en naturaleza, en particular relacionados con el proyecto del Cinturón Verde? Y si hay alguna diferencia entre esta evaluación para ciudades grandes y ciudades pequeñas. Eh, en ese orden, si nos pueden responder muy apretado en el tiempo, por favor. Eh, gracias. Okay, well, I'll start very quickly in answering the question to the extent that I can. I'd say right off the bat that the traditional project cost benefit analyses really struggle with incorporating externalities uh, by definition. And I've, I've actually been looking at that issue, I think, for about 15 years now. Uh, we started off looking at the question with biodiversity and water in a dam project in Costa Rica and trying to understand what, how you would incorporate that into the overall cost benefit analysis. We've also been working ex uh, increasingly with things like shadow carbon pricing mechanisms that can begin to incorporate some of these costs uh, and we're increasingly using that in, in relevant projects. However, ultimately it's, it's really, and Mara was clear about this, it's difficult to capture the potential benefit flows that come from the services and turn them into financial flows as well. Uh, the challenge being that these things are often considered as public goods, so they're not normally paid for. Um, and there's really no clear and accepted mechanism for measuring, accounting, and valuing for the kinds of services that we're looking at. Um, with biodiversity, we've been working with the government of Costa Rica to think about how you might account for these things and incorporate them into national accounts. We're not the, obviously the only bank that's doing that. Many, many banks are trying to move forward those kinds of processes. Um, and I think it's also a very similar challenge to, it's the same challenge as trying to, for example, estimate the true cost of using fossil fuels. Uh, you have to include the environmental and health costs of fossil fuels to be able to get a much better picture of what's going on. And I do think that things are changing. I think things are moving forward. I think the recent reports by the IMF and others are basically drawing attention to these costs. And I think ultimately the way forward is that the, the way we do cost benefit analysis is gonna to have to change and it's gonna to have to incorporate these issues. And I'll stop there. I think that's, 
Gracias, Graham. Chivesa, dos minutos, por favor. Gracias. Um, all right, I will also try to be as uh, quick as I can. Um, sorry, my video is not starting, but I will proceed nonetheless. So the question about the barriers to developing uh, bankable projects, I think the barriers are the same in, uh, in the LAC region as anywhere else. And the first of one I think Graham has already alluded to, I mean, water is a, is a basic need um, and you know, pricing it at, at cost can be politically sensitive and it might disadvantage those who cannot afford to, to pay. And uh, specifically in the context of uh, climate funds such as the GCF, um, some countries lack the data required to prove that the problem that the project they've designed is intended to address has been caused or exacerbated by climate change. And because as a climate fund, we can only, uh, you know, pay the, the, the cost for, for climate change induced problems. Um, and a lot of the problems in the water sector uh, might actually not be climate change in induced. Some of them are due to lack of uh, O&M of infrastructure, for instance, or they might be due to infrastructure having been built in, in the wrong locations in the first place. Um, it, it can be often difficult to prove that uh, the, a project is designed to, to overcome a genuinely climate induced problem. Um, on the question around uh, Leveraging non-concessional uh, loans. Chivesa, dis discúlpame, Chivesa, pero tenemos un minuto y vamos a dejar esa pregunta para el chat eh, para darle oportunidad a Mara. Lo siento, eh, pero el tiempo nos quema. All right, all right. Okay, so Mara. yes, I'm going to talk how we measure the benefits of uh, Green Belt Watershed Program. The benefits are related to the water quality for long term mainly we can um, we can measure the benefits comparing the indexes and comparing the cost to treat the water mainly uh, so you asked me also if the scale of action is different in a small scale or in a big scale i think it's extremely different in our experience to implement a project in a large scale it's tremendously difficult so uh, what i can see what what i can say it's now it's that, and I'm available to complete the answer after this uh, session. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Mara. Es una pena que no tengamos más tiempo. Sí. Y ahora invito a Franz Rojas del Banco de Desarrollo de América Latina para que nos ayude a cerrar esta sesión, dejándonos un par de ideas en la cabeza. Franz, adelante. Muchas gracias, Hugo. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Uh, we have had a rich session about financing resilient solutions. And as you know, this session was focused on the Latin American Caribbean region that we could call the continent of waters because it's well known the 30% of world water availability. But the fact is the asymmetrical distribution of water. And we have uh, three challenges ahead, too little, we are too much and too polluted regarding to water because droughts are becoming worse in arid zones and Latin America has many arid zones and also floods have increased about 40% in the last 15 years compared with the previous uh, pre period and also we have 63 or more untreated wastewater. So these are the challenges and in the other side we have the SDGs targets and NDCs to, that impose a superb challenge to cope some numbers could be in the world 6.7 trillion or no, or 1.7 trillion. But what we are sure is that the current investment is insufficient. Graham mentioned the different alternatives of financing, also from the, the public finance side with the taxes in the way of grants, uh, payment for environmental services and others, and private finance coming like uh, climate or bonds or green bonds, environmental impact bonds and others. But what is important for this session is to see that uh, we have good, very good examples on how uh, climate fin finance and emerging blending finance can cope and can leverage uh, investments that we need in the region. Uh, Graham also stressed on the links about water biodiversity and, and climate and the ties on, on climate and water. 
and he gave some examples of Bolivia and Panama that is very welcome to show us that it's we are not talking about theoretical aspects but real and practical uh, cases. Uh, we welcome uh, that Chivesa Pensula from GCA pointed out many examples as well, but also I would like to, to highlight two aspects. The guidelines, the sector guidelines, they are providing to accelerate investments and also the simplified procedures for small projects that also can handle and, and accelerate investments. The, the, the important uh, example from Sabesp that Mara show and share with us is that we are not talking about a small project. It's around, we are talking about restoration program of 33,000 hectares uh, to control, uh, to preserve and also to control the threat of encroaching urbanization or watershed lands. And as we see in the, the literature, we've seen that in the region, we have around 47 or more watershed compensation or restoration projects, but this project is covered by tariffs. I think that's important because we're not talking about uh, grants or philanthropic donation, but in tariffs. And I think it's, it's very iconic in that way. Uh, of course, the challenge remains for medium or small water utilities because we know Sabesp is the biggest water utility in the region. But I think the future looks promising and a combination of grants, donations, concessional loans, either coming from multilateral entities or climate funds can also leverage non-concessional loans or commercial loans to uh, accelerate and to make the difference in the region. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Franz, y con eso cerramos la sesión. Eh, no sin antes pedirles que respondan a una, a una encuesta eh, y les agradecemos a todos donde estén y sobre todo a nuestros panelistas por esta thought-provoking session. Muchas gracias y que tengan ustedes un muy buen día. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Gracias.